Well, hello to everyone. This is Saikat Das, and I'm currently pursuing my master's in economics and policy of energy and climate change at the University of Strathclyde, in the heart of Scotland, is Glasgow. So the world is reaching the tipping point beyond which climate change may become irreversible, said by Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of UN. This podcast is immensely important as the topic today is exclusively related to my dissertation which is is achieving a net zero emission target and having the risk of carbon leakage a paradox in this podcast we are immensely honored to have both of our guests today our first guest is Dr Ronit Chatterjee specialist business innovation unit Ronit received his doctorate of philosophy PhD focused on disaster management from Tokyo University having a plethora of publications published worldwide he is also co-founder of Rika India a social entrepreneur startup established to support research innovation and evidence based policy making in the Asia specific region working closely with an esteemed organizations such as the UN SARC etc and go on thank you ronit for being here and accepting my invite in a short period of time and we will have a discussion and a lot to take from you Thank you so much for being here. Our second guest is Dr. Robert Chernock, Director of Metis Institute of Climate and Strategy, Director of Climate Change and Sustainability at RSK Center of Sustainability Excellence. Robert specializes in climate related finance and disclosures, TCFD related climate scenario analysis, as well as carbon accounting, net zero accounting, working across regulators, industry think tanks and academics to develop practical research insights. He received his PhD in carbon accounting from the London School of Economics and Political Science while working with the United Nations to develop a financial sector toolkit for analyzing and managing the risk of climate change. Thank you Ronit and uh, of course thank you Robert for being here and uh, really it's a pleasure to have you in my podcast and thanks for accepting the invite. Well thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes it is. A, it's a great pleasure to be with you Saik. Thanks to both. So recently representing more than 60% of global emissions about 2/3 of global gdp and more than half of the global population have adopted net zero targets to phase out actively linked to the generation of greenhouse gas emissions including key players such as china and the us eu and japan even though actual measures for their implementations are still under deliberations and few of them have been put forward at the cop26 climate conference held in glasgow The rapid spread of this target might well be considered a promising prospect of climate policy that is in line with the targets of the Paris Agreement. So why is net zero important? The science clearly shows that to avert the worst impacts of climate change and preserve a livable planet, global temperature increases need to be limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Currently the earth is already about 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than it was in the late 1800. to keep global warming to not more than 1.5 degrees celsius as called for it the paris agreement emissions need to be reduced by 45% by 2030 and reach near zero by 2050 so that's for the net zero emissions so let's move forward with our topic carbon leakage its importance occurrence anti leakage policies and so on stay tuned until the end because we will be discussing with our guest about the carbon leakage and its anti leakage policies and many more informations that you can take away from our guests and from this podcast so carbon leakage can be defined as the displacement of commerce or activities related to the economy usually changes in investment patterns that results in direct or indirect emissions of greenhouse gas to be displaced from the jurisdiction with greenhouse gas constraint to another jurisdiction with the low or less stringent policy of greenhouse constraints concern about the impact of carbon policies including pricing regulation subsidies and standard to competitiveness and carbon leakage particularly affect energy intensive trade expos industries eite eit industries are constrained in their ability to pass through carbon policy cost due to actual or potential international power competitions in the light of net zero ambitions this poses a unique challenge for carbon policy designs measures aim at mitigation that concerns are often a trade off between preserving competitiveness and incentive emissions reductions so many studies 
suggested that carbon pricing will cause jobs to be lost through a loss of competitiveness and global emissions to increase through carbon leakage. If these assertions are true, then policymakers may need to just for example subsidize threatened industries and apply border tax adjustments to equalize the carbon prices. Welcome everyone to the podcast again and uh, we are discussing about uh, the carbon leakage and its cause and what exactly the background is. So yeah, effective global corporations or to mitigate climate change has proven difficult to achieve. Several countries are unilaterally abating carbon emissions. One example is the emission trading system of EU, EU ETS. However, unilateral climate policies can in principle lead to carbon leakage whereby domestic emissions reductions are offset by increase in other countries. Carbon leakage is a potential of significance concern for policymakers and a key parameter for the international climate policy discussion. Along with affecting the unilateral environmental policies, carbon leakage undermines a loss of domestic environmental economic competitiveness and global market share if production cost increases, therefore inducing production to shift to other countries alongside emissions. And next, carbon leakage provides the rationally for border carbon adjustment mechanism which continues to be a debate. Basically countries with carbon control risk losing global market shares to competing countries without control which will counteract the net emissions reduction target attempted by the countries to address climate changes. So talking about short term effects there is also a long term effects possibility that future investments by the GSG intensive industry would be channeled to countries with no or less stringent policy control bypassing carbon reductions needs and potentially locking in obsolete technologies so this scenario of transition would be very harmful to achieve the global goal of future reductions of emission so now we are defining a path toward net zero emissions until 2050 as a global target. However, we have to also include the leakage problem into the whole emission part if it won't be included in the emissions total net reductions. So that means we are not getting towards the net zero emissions, which is a paradox in the overall scenario. So yes. When we are planning to go towards the zero emission targets, we have to take care of the leakage problem. So Ronit and Robert, since 1990s, several studies and assessments has been conducted to determine the extent to which carbon leakage occurs. For instance, uh, Ruth Fort on 1993, Cararo on 1993 also. And further, Rothman, a famous research scholar, argued long back about two factors that are backbone of leakage occurrence. Industry scallops in a participant nation and relocating to a non-participant country with less stringent policies. Other, greater consumption in one nation is met by improved productivity in another. So, according to my research, both points are interlinked by having a stringent environmental policy or having a price of carbon on a production. What's your viewpoint on it? Do we have any other occurrence point to add? Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's obviously a very active debate, especially since hearing what's happened with CBAM, uh, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism in Europe, but also with conversations out of Canada and the US. So clearly, this is a topic that people are grappling with right now. I think my view would be similar to if we talk about emissions trading schemes at some point, which is these, these tackle a fundamental issue in how we're trying to address climate change. So we can talk about whether it's right or needed right now, but really the point is that if we're going to, as a world, tackle this issue, then we have to try to price that cost of carbon in. And if, if that isn't happening because production is being moved into jurisdictions that don't have prices on carbon or don't have the same or effective prices on carbon, then we're essentially uh, failing from the economic point of view of how to tackle climate change. So Ronit, what's your intake on it? Uh, that's a very interesting uh, viewpoint, Saika, that you have shared. And I think uh, what you are referring to these studies that have been done earlier, say, almost two decades from now, uh, the world has changed considerably. Also, the commerce and the way we are looking at the international relations have changed, right? So with this changing landscape of international relations, commerce, and mobility across the world, I think there are other points which have possibly come in and you might would like to consider those points as well. And out of those, like many, um, there might be more points, but there are a few that I would like to highlight here is, you know, uh, when it comes to international uh, 
policy or international relations between countries yes it's one part is actually you know offsetting one country's consumption pattern or everything on the other which is possibly having a lower carbon footprint but then you take advantage of it and but the more driving force is the kind of relation that that one country has with the other country the second part economic ambition of a country and that also influences a, a country which is possibly having a lower carbon footprint to yeah to take up uh, you know the carbon dump of other countries with linking it to the economic or financial gains or possibly uh, non financial gains it can be cash or kind right so but it also plays the uh, the ambition to uh, have more say in the world politics as well as uh, financial um, gains that you can get out of it so that also influences such decisions third and most important as like you know when we say about uh, the businesses migrating from one uh, location geographic location to the other a very important part of migration uh, are two one is the human resource policies and the availability cost of human resource because no business would actually migrate if the ecosystem in which they are migrating is favorable and profitable so according to the research i confront another driver in the increasing transportation shipments that is high carbon intensity sector and across multiple borders multiple times is it important to inculcate or relate to this earlier mentioned driver or it just happened in time span well if we think about the driver from two points of view one the driver can be um from the point of view as does it contribute to greenhouse gas emissions for the global problem which yes it will do you know if there is you're adding an extra carbon intensive element to the supply chain on the other hand is does it make a difference in terms of the cost that one individual company will bear by producing or purchasing the product and there i think it becomes a question of how you account for the emissions because if the shipping company for instance has to pay for the emissions from their own shipments then you're kind of covering those and that will be embedded in the cost of shipping whereas if the company is not responsible for the emissions from their ships for instance then that's unpriced carbon so i suppose the point is is the carbon priced somewhere in the supply chain i don't see a huge need to double price double count but it definitely needs to be priced in somehow as the same question to ronit please yes i think that uh, with globalization this mobility has become a very important factor right and how the supply chain works across different geographies is because again the company needs to make a profit at the end of of course they need to look at the net zero policies carbon policies and all those things are there but at the end a business needs to make profit to sustain Welcome everyone once again in my podcast. Today carbon price widely varies from less than 1 US dollar in Ukraine to 130 US dollar in Sweden. It is clear to many that carbon prices are generally still not aligned with those that would be required to achieve the Paris Agreement objectives. Apart from carbon price, more generally the recent release partial report from the IPCC clearly indicates that more climate ambition is needed if we are to reach the paris agreement goals also i have in mind in a world bank estimate that quotes a price of 100 usd per ton to achieve the price of paris agreement targets so how do you look into that is a way that we have to micromanage everything wow uh, i yes it's a good question um about how to be how do we approach this i think when we think about policy responses to climate change there is often a temptation to think you know we found the answer or we found the critical things that are necessary to make progress um i think from all of my research everything comes towards the conclusion of we need everybody to be doing as much as is possible so i think smaller interventions can be highly effective in specific areas now that might just be one tiny piece of the whole climate change puzzle but if there are a thousand pieces and more than a thousand people working on them then we can fix it um i think if we try if we spend the time trying to find one or two or a handful of policies that can really fix the problem we'll still be debating this in 50 years and we won't have tackled it 
everybody needs to be doing something, no matter how small it seems, because if we all do something at the same time, we will push the momentum towards tackling climate change. Uh, so well said, yeah, thank you so much for the answer, Robert. So next question is for Anit. Even if the various anti-leakage policy measures are often in the focus of theoretical and applied work, but their implications for the shifting of burdens are likely to be a just a mere of not more than significant in the existing international policy discussion. So even if IPCC stated that leakage levels are minimal to be acknowledged as a critical scenario for lowering target emissions, right? However, it also reminds me of the studies and statistics that shows that emission level increased worldwide as compared to the world's leading exporters and importers, therefore US and China. And of course, after China joined the WTO in 2001, the emission climbed up to 80%. Does this contradict the statements? <laughs> That's a very tricky question. But I think, yes, what happens, you know, when you join the WTO or any such, you know, global or regional um, organization, you, at the one advantage that a country would like to draw out of it is the reduction in the tariffs. And if I look at China, especially, mm -hmm. China ha used to have two models early 90s or late 90s. One was a traditional Chinese model in which they used to operate. And the second one where they were trying to capitalize was the import-export model, right? And with this entry into WTO, that import-export model actually gained an upper hand. And with the import-export, it just is not about just commodity. It also is about importing, exporting the carbon, right? And that import-export became backed by the lower tariffs as part of being with WTO. It became an opportunity for the industrial nations to actually offset their carbon emissions and dump to all these smaller countries. And in benefit, they get the economical advantage, which I was telling you earlier. So that international relation and economic ambition actually plays out a very important role in this. Thank you so much for the answer, Ronit. And uh, of course, it makes sense a lot. So next discussion with Dr. Robert. So Robert, implementing a tax also might increase emissions because let's take the US emits significant more CO2 most than other countries. Reducing US emissions can contribute to reducing total global emissions. However, imposing a carbon tax or other policies to reduce emissions in one country can lead to increased emissions elsewhere, which we already been talking about is called the carbon leakage. In this perspective, which can occur for a variety of reasons like uh, production of some carbon intensive goods to move abroad to avoid the taxes. Secondly, reducing US demand for fossil fuels would result in lower global price of those fuels, making more attractive in unregulated countries. A research finds that uh, on average, a 10% reduction in carbon emissions in the United States would be partially offset by 1% to 3% increase elsewhere. So, what's your uptake on that? And as taxes are important to lower emissions, what's the simplest way to neglect emissions and leakage in this scenario? Well, the first thing I'll say comes back to my original point that these are, this is a regulatory infrastructure we need to build around the world. If the world thinks we can tackle climate change by putting a price on greenhouse gas emissions, then it has to be priced throughout the supply chain and across jurisdictions. So yes, right now there will be a couple, there may be a couple of consequences in terms of carbon leakage, things moving as a consequence of taxes. But if we, if, if our philosophy of how we tackle climate change is about pricing carbon, then we have to press ahead with this. And if the system isn't quite right now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't implement these new policies, these taxes, these adjustment mechanisms. What it means is we need to identify that there's now a new priority that we work on. So we're not opposed to the idea of pricing carbon. I just think this is going to be an ongoing project where every year for the next 20 years, we'll be finding the extra instrument that we need to use to make it more effective. And that's an ongoing project. Look, my background is accounting. I've been trained in accounting throughout the whole time, and I'm applying that to climate change. I'm doing my little part, if you like. But accounting has evolved since, what, 14th century Italy from Luca Pacioli's work. I mean, this has had hundreds and hundreds of years to evolve. With carbon accounting, with carbon pricing, we are still in the early stages of developing and inventing this. And we're doing a good job, but it's not perfect. But it is getting better and better all the time. Thank you, Robert, for the insight. And of course, moving ahead for Ronit, often when people talk about carbon price, they refer to revenue neutral carbon price, which means the full value of the price is rebated by the government 
to the taxpayers basically that's to avert the political assertions over the proper size of the government can you provide some general idea about what is carbon price is and what is the carbon tax okay so let me talk about the carbon price because carbon tax is actually part of carbon pricing when we talk about carbon price it's basically the kind of tool which makes you pay or the public not you only but us as well it's an instrument which uh, captures the external cost of the emissions and then offsets it to the public to pay for kind of the impacts like say for example uh, damage to the crops or high expenditures on the health care so these all are then equated with the carbon dioxide emitted and that becomes kind of a mechanism to evaluate or kind of assess and that's possibly in short what carbon pricing would be and carbon tax is actually part of this carbon t- uh, pricing there are possibly two different uh, ways of carbon pricing that's generally followed one is this um, tax and the other is the emission trading system so under carbon tax uh, there are specific rate for per ton of carbon emission carbon pricing is more an umbrella term under which this carbon tax comes in well fantastically explained thank you so much ronit for this next question is for dr robert according to the global trade alert organizations abating countries efforts to reduce emissions will be partially countered by rising emissions in non abating countries which will also experience a loss of revenues and job Not only this carbon leakage phenomenon render emission reduction costly and inefficiently but it also offers an additional incentive for free riding behaviors which threatens the viability of international climate agreements few research says that carbon leakage requires political adjustments from a generic approach with the carbon tax equals among sectors to taxes that are differentiated among sectors so how it is political barrier affecting the phenomenon also significant political economic issues may be utilized to delay the formation of an international coalition of active nations yeah the way i see the politics of this is in is in two parts uh, on the on the one side you've got the politics around uh, leveling the playing field for carbon pricing so if we start just with that first point um the the difficult thing with this is <sighs> as we've seen with united nations negotiations for decades now it's very difficult to get everybody to sign up to one thing right now everyone's got different points of view and that's quite right nations have their own sovereignty they get to decide i think the thing with adjustment mechanisms on borders for instance is it can appeal to both sides of the aisle if you've got a typical kind of bipartisan approach whether you look at the us or the uk for instance because on the one hand you can have that these are effective climate policies and on the other hand you've got a site a way of making sure there's a level competitive playing field for industry. So you've got it, it it marries both of those objectives into one policy. And the policies that in my view are most effective are the ones that are also politically feasible as well. You can have an optimal idealized theory that no politician will touch. Is it effective? Well, it's ideal on paper, but it might not see the light of day. The other side to this, so the second part is the politics of how to address something like carbon pricing globally because it's nice to say we should have this level level playing field but that comes against another core principle of the Paris agreement which is common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities if that's too much for mouthful CBRD hyphen RC <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> if you love your acronyms so the idea behind the <laughs> the the idea behind this common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities is that and the way that manifests in the paris agreement is each nation can chart its own course towards net zero towards 2 degrees towards 1.5 degrees targets as well that respects national sovereignty and that's critical you know that has to be respected by the un otherwise it starts becoming a fight about one part of the world telling another part of the world what to do so these different trajectories have to be allowed that that is how we're going to get these global me- political mechanisms to work the issue is how do you then create a level playing field if different nations are allowed to delay their action by a certain number of years compared to other nations and again to me that comes down to the question of somebody has to get going and the people who have the responsibility to get going to me are the ones that have benefited most from the industrial revolution so far but have not yet really paid the the price of the carbon that they emitted earlier
So if we come back to the, what I said about the EU, Canada, and the US, for instance, it's fantastic that you have certain blocks of nations or nations that are active in this debate and looking how to do these, use these policies and learn from these policies. Because at the end of the day, all that knowledge is going to be useful all around the world at some point. And if not right away, then very soon, because the momentum is shifting towards tackling climate change, fortunately. <laughs> of course, 100%. So from your statement, I just remember that uh, Nobel Prize winner William Norris had argued convincingly that the problem of free riding on climate actions cannot be simply overcome by voluntary agreements such as attempt with the Paris Accord. Instead, he proposed a simple idea of like a club to implement through climate actions and the climate actions could be significantly more ambitious than loose Paris agreements. To achieve the ambitions, the club would agree a high common carbon price for all club members while penalizing countries to do not participate. The penalty on non-participants are necessary to keep the club running together. So as you said, different agreements, different policies, different places really have different targets. I think a climate club could be an answer for all of the problems. Can I ask a question on the, on the notion of climate clubs? Would you call the European Union a climate club? Wow, never thought of it. So uh, the answer is really ambiguous in nature because uh, as European Union is already a coalition of nations, so those nations are already acting since a long time for lowering the carbon emissions and uh, EU is the first nation who implemented that ETS and all the measures that they can take for uh, minimizing the emissions. If I speak about climate club, getting the uh, that ambition done, the climate club would agree on a high common carbon price for all club members while penalizing countries that do not participate. The penalty of all non-participants is necessary to keep the climate club together. So European Union has never understood the importance of external trade measures for its climate policy. I think carbon border adjustment has been a long time pending uh, with WTO rules in line and uh, it's, it's, it's been implemented in a pilot stage so, yeah, true. European Union does not consider carbon border adjustment to be a penalty. Instead, it is an important part of leveling the playing field and avoiding carbon leakage. However, as a club, everyone should be in the same page. But stakeholders from industries such as steel, aluminium and cement have expressed some concern about the CBAM and ETS. For instance, as per news, the claim that the additional direct carbon cost for the steel industry with the combined effect of CBAM and ETS for the free locations phase out will be nearly 14 billion euros in 2030 with business as usual emissions or 8.4 billion euros if the sector is able to reduce its emission by 30% by 2030. So by this we can see a gap in the willingness, uh, of course the acceptance also. But in the, on the other hand, there are many proposals uh, and of course the articles also that Europe should propose to the incoming US president to create a climate club with a common go border adjustment, CBAM. So I think um, internally no border tariffs should be applied since both economy would implement a comparable you know, minimum price of greenhouse gas emissions. Although, uh, after all, like, see, uh, the two economies still makes some of like 40% of global GDP. So either of the way, uh, the abatements has become much more cheaper with a price comparative green technologies. So a simple CBAM would uh, well be enough to keep the club stable. So yeah, I think uh, we should take an example like how the club should work from the EU, but uh, shouldn't identify it as a club. Impressive answer. Very impressive answer. Hi everyone and welcome once again. So Robert, as your background is finance, so this question is for you that uh, do you see a difference between let's say a carbon tax proper and a carbon set through a trading scheme or a carbon dividend methods for imposing a price? Mm. <laughs> oh, well, it's, I mean, it's a difficult question and if you look at, look at the history of why we ended up with an emissions trading scheme in Europe, well, Europe wanted a carbon tax, but that is a fiscal policy. And to pass a fiscal policy through the EU, you have to have unanimous approval from all member states. So one state disagrees and it's blocked. An emissions trading scheme was not a fiscal policy. So that could get through without unanimous approval. So in that sense, it, again, it comes back to this point of what's politically possible in, in a certain space.
In some spaces, a carbon tax is attractive because you can get a tax through. There is an established mechanism for that tax. You can then look at how the proceeds of the tax will be distributed and you can explain the whole package as a very coherent approach. In other places, the idea of introducing a new tax is not going to happen. It's not going to gain support. And so you need a different an alternative. And in many instances, you find that saying, let's trust the market to come up with the answer and the best price is, is much more palatable. And so you find emissions trading schemes taking hold. So which, which approach is best? I, this is why I'm, I'm circling back now to saying it depends. What is most politically feasible where you are? And if both options are politically feasible, first off, I'm surprised. But secondly, that's a great dilemma in that case to have because you can really figure out which is optimal from an economic and climate point of view. Um, I would say in most instances, though, it will be clear that one is going to be an easier system in a specific jurisdiction uh, to, to bring online. Well, thank you, Robert. It was a well-structured answer. And of course, it was really insightful, as it always depends on economical, environmental and, of course, financial structures to be implemented. Uh, but I, I will say there's, there's a much bigger debate to be had if you're just talking about which, of, which policy is economically optimal. Um, but again, I come back to the point I made earlier. If we wait to find the most economically optimal approach, we'll be sat around for a very long time not doing anything. And then we'll try to use the most optimal approach and realize it doesn't work in practice for various reasons. So we have to try these things. And by trying them, we learn more and we learn what's possible and what's not. And we can evolve as a consequence. So I think there's a lot of learning by doing here. And what the benefit of that is it's, it means we make progress. Even if we don't get it perfect the first time, we get it roughly in the right direction. And we can then tweak it and make it better as we go. So it avoids this kind of perfectionism and says, we'll do our best and we'll commit to learning and improving on it. That, to me, is how we're going to make progress on this. Well, thank you, Robert, for the answer. As we coming towards the podcast topic, as it's related to achieving the global target of net zero emissions, we have also the emerging problem of carbon leakage, which can affect the targets of net zero emissions. And of course, we have to consider some economic parameters. So can we put some light on it, like how we are achieving the net zero emissions if we have the problem of carbon leakage? Isn't it a paradox in nature? Sure, sure. So um, maybe I'll just try to give a uh, kind of example to elaborate on this. Okay, you produce electricity electricity with uh, using minimum energy or use electric vehicles so that you have very low emission. But having said that, who have the financial capacity to do that? See, one part is the technology transfer or the technology availability, right? So that kind of a technology availability is actually controlled by a handful of nations. It's possibly for their benefit, they can do this technology share or transfer. Also, the technology sharing and transfer doesn't come at uh, no cost, right? It has a cost to it. And the affordability of this usage of technology needs to be there. So if you are trying to have the affordability in very small countries, which are not so economically developed, it's a paradox. <laughs> you cannot achieve it. The citizens cannot afford. And if they have, they can afford, they the government actually needs to have subsidies. And in order to give those high subsidies, the government again have to borrow. Because if the economic right economy doesn't support the government needs to borrow from somewhere and then where will they borrow so they will go back to these nations they will fall into the debt trap right and they will fall into this vicious cycle of debt and at the end they will end up being puppet in the hands of all these developed nations and also the acceptance level because many countries are not there is a digital divide in many countries, even in India specifically, we have a huge digital divide. So whom are we targeting? Uh, what part of the citizen are we targeting this? That also is important. And because when you levy the tax, it's a uniform blanket tax, which every other citizen pays. Wow, it was fantastic and well-detailed elaboration you given. So what's your intake for the same question? What do you say, Robert? It's a, it's a really difficult question. I'm glad it's your research question, and I hope to see you come up with an answer by the end of this project. I would say my the way I would think about this uh, is similar to the point I made earlier on the tension between creating a level playing field while respecting national sovereignty and the rights of certain nations to take action on a different time frame. 
So the way that the Paris Agreement operates, there is a, some a, one option on the table for how we do this, which is every nation must communicate its own nationally determined contribution, or NDC, to the United Nations process for climate change. And that essentially outlines their plan for how they're going to hit net zero in line with the Paris Agreement, what their current plans and policies are. Now, nationally determined contributions require countries to communicate their plans for achieving net zero, and what the current policy situation is and what their intentions are for which policies will be brought online. Every five years, those have to be strengthened through a stock-taking mechanism that's part of the Paris Agreement. And the idea is eventually we'll end up at net zero aligned with this 2 to 1.5 kind of target. So to me, the question would be, if, we, if there is carbon leakage, are we already capturing that in these nationally determined contributions? Because a nationally determined contribution in certain developing nations may well show that there's going to be a growth of certain carbon intensive industries. And there's many reasons behind that. Carbon leakage won't be the only one. But is there a plan in place for how that carbon intensive industry can grow, but new policies brought online to clean it and then to eventually either clean it completely or to transition into a new industry afterwards. So in that regard, if you take the dynamic view of progress on climate change and you look at nationally determined contributions, you could argue that if we can handle these NDCs appropriately and the global stock take appropriately, then we're kind of actually figuring out carbon leakage in the process. So carbon leakage becomes a problem for a nation that's imposing a price on carbon and is worried about the competitiveness of its own industry. But from a climate change point of view, this is part of putting the price on carbon globally. So I think, I think there's ways to make it work. I don't, I don't think putting a price on carbon is a problem for climate change. That is going to help make progress. Um, I think what countries will look at is how can they level the playing field. And the more work that's done, the more pressure will be on the nations that are the great producers of the world to look at the markets where they're trying to sell to that have these adjustment mechanisms and focus a bit more on their impact in terms of carbon, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Welcome everyone into my podcast where we've been discussing about the carbon leakage into the space problem. Let's get to know and have some discussions on carbon leakage, which occurs across the time. And it's also called the intertemporal leakage, which is very popularly known in the economic world as the green paradox. So climate policies at specific location reduces fossil fuel consumption and market price. Another spot may boost is fossil fuel usage in response to the price drop, offsetting some emissions saving as per research conducted. The mere prospect of strict climate legislations might encourage fossil fuel producers to expedite extractions, causing intertemporal leakage, also known as the green paradox. According to my research, the green paradox concerns two main forms. One is the attempt to limit GHG emissions may be partially or completely undone by emissions leakage, not just between nations but also over time, given that the principal source of GHGs are exhaustible resources. A second issue is that in additions to emissions leakage over time, certain attempts to promote a transition to clean energy may accelerate emissions to the point that the current value of climate change damages may increase. So, Ronit, is it the technology transfer cost that matters or the policy strictness may be crucial to be stringent? Because few scholarly articles states that for all policies, leakage rates are highest when policies are weak, but leakage rates tends to be declined as reduction aims grow more ambitiously. Okay, so um, if I, like, one part is the technology transfer cost, and that's always high, right? Though uh, governments might want, in the initial phase, they might give subsidies and all, but at the end, they have to recover the cost, actual cost. So technological transfer cost, it depends on which kind of, if you look at a temporal scale, possibly initially it might be low to entice more, you know, governments to be part of it, but later on it possibly becomes the real self and it starts uh, pinching you that's one or policy strictness yes policy strictness is possibly um i would suggest a more important factor because people try to exploit not the policy strictness but policy monitoring and the amend like see any policy when you make is possibly not a hundred percent foolproof policy but 
what needs to be done is once the policy is made, people are actually implementing it. Many countries actually do not approach policies with evidence-based research. And this is more evident in the developing, least developed countries. This loophole is generally, you know, exploited for leakage. Exactly. Thank you so much for the answer. I think the policy and the technology transfer both plays a crucial role on this phenomenon. So moving ahead with another question that is for Dr. Robert. Now we'll talk about EU ETS, which has been on a roller coaster ride for the past 15 years. As the carbon border adjustment mechanism was approved by the European Commission in July 2021, CBAM, the goal of the proposal is to make importers buy carbon certificates equal to the price of carbon that would have been paid if the goods have been made under the rules of pricing carbon in the EU. On the other hand, if a non EU producers can show that they have already paid for the carbon used to make the goods they are importing from the third country, the EU importers can deduct the full cost from the non EU producers. Stakeholders from industries such as steel, aluminium, and cement have expressed some concern about the CBAM and ETS. For instance, as per news, they claim that the additional direct carbon cost for the steel industry with the combined effect of CBAM and ETS on the free allocation phase out will be nearly 14 billion euros in 2030 with a business as usual emissions or 8.4 billion euros if the sector is able to reduce its emissions by 30% by 2030. In addition, the industry asserts that in 2030, a typical EU steel business equipping its plant with clean technology will incur 400 million euros in carbon expenses, whereas a comparable non-EU company selling steel into the EU market will incur only 30 million euros in cost, notwithstanding the CBAM tax. So can we say that the recent EU ETS was not successful in lowering emissions and is a reason for increasing carbon leakage, for which CBAM is the, in the proposal? You see, this is a difficult question to ask an accountant, because accountants will always ask, what is the boundary of the entity? Are we talking about for Europe itself? Are we talking about Europe's trading partners, or are we talking about the problem of climate change as what we're trying to tackle? And if we're thinking about tackling climate change, well, the EU ETS was our great attempt at developing a market that would put a price on carbon. And the amount that we learned from that and how the EU ETS has evolved, how we've seen lessons from that taken up in, say, China's regional and national emissions trading schemes as well, this is, again, part of the learning curve. So you have to attempt this in order to figure out how these mechanisms and uh, processes will work. Whether uh, Whether it had a major impact on emissions in the EU, frankly, I'm not an expert in that. And you'll have to go to somebody who is who specializes in the EU ETS. Um, But what I will say is, again, um, I will be stunned if we come up with one solution that tackles every every aspect of climate change perfectly. I don't think that's human nature. I think human nature is give it a go and make it work better eventually. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and, that, and that's what's happening with emissions trading schemes. It's happening with emissions trading schemes. You're seeing them come up all around the world now. You've got fantastic trackers for these trading schemes and how they work and the different mechanisms they're using. Um, so you can see that it's an ongoing effort to make this work because clearly it's one of the theoretical approaches that's also quite practical and therefore is a viable option in a lot of places for driving climate action. Uh, It does make sense because for a unilateral policy for the whole world, we have to go through many step-by-step hit and trial methods and through growth in the learning curve, we will find a way to tackle the emissions and the leakages. And of course, as you said, it's theoretical approach initially and we have to apply in, in the real world. So the next discussion with Ronit is about the empirical evidences and the parameters and studies that scientists and researchers has to cover within their studies so that they can tackle the carbon leakage. And what's your intake and recommendation on that? So what, there are two, three things that I would like to say here. One is, of course, generate evidences, not just work on models like simulation models, because simulation models, you cannot have all existive factors to actually look into. So you have to look at evidences to build on. And that's one. The second is look at the will of the people and the social factors linked to the carbon leakage issues rather than just looking at the carbon leakage from an economic and business perspective. And the third thing, which is I think possibly you might would like to look at is also when we talk about carbon leakage, Right. It's between two specific countries. But what is more important is because of these two countries, 
the carbon price is not limited to those two regions it actually might spill over to other regions as well to the neighboring countries that itself they become collateral damage in such case so that also is something that needs to be considered and when you said about this club so it's just not about you know people who are who are part of this kind of an agreement they should come in but also they should look at this collateral damage uh, part as well and bring them as part of it because they are possibly the ones who are suffering without any reason for their own i think these are three things that i would say that needs to be looked into for future well that's an interesting recommendation on it and of course as you said that the spillover effect increasing the prices and of course about the club is really interesting so robert what's your recommendation and uptakes for the carbon leakage problem my recommendation for what's happening with say anti leakage policies and carbon pricing policies is to remember that these don't operate in isolation so there can be great debates among economists about the right way for this to happen and that has an influence on the global debate as well but we also have the paris agreement and we have nationally determined contributions that are communicated as part of that so we do have an entire political context that surrounds these economic instruments as well So I suppose the question would be if we're really scared about carbon leakage elsewhere in the world well are those other parts of the world also being required to take action on climate change that's aligned with the Paris agreement and the answer is yes the Paris agreement's in place and there are nationally determined contributions the question is how do we make that process most effective as well and i think if we focus too much on well, not too much but if if we only look at the economic side of it then we miss the other side which is how do we create the conditions in which the whole world starts taking climate change seriously and acting on it because if you only have say one climate club that's incredibly effective at tackling climate change but the rest of the world ignoring it that's a problem whereas if you have the entire world taking the issue seriously and accepting that the economic instruments aren't perfect but they help progress that's a much more viable way of tackling the issue so i would say don't look at carbon leakage only in isolation look that even if there is leaking into different jurisdiction what are the pressures in those jurisdictions are other countries going to be perfectly happy in saying yes we'll take your you know cheaper carbon intensive industries and put that on our carbon footprint and d- destroy our own carbon targets or will certain countries say no no we know what our economic development looks like and we know it has to look low carbon don't you try and give us your dirty stuff you know we know that that's not going to be economically viable in 30 years so you know there there's another side of it i suppose we look at carbon leakage sometimes from the view of where that carbon is being moved away from whereas you could also turn it around and say well do pe- what are people going to be receiving this carbon perfectly willingly and and maybe maybe in some instances but if the whole world is taking the climate target seriously and that paris agreement is in, is working as designed and is implemented in an effective manner then i think you'll find the opportunities for carbon leakage are themselves reduced as well so e- these economic instruments do not operate in a vacuum well thank you so much for the recommendations and of course that's an amazing insights that you both given to us so there's an interesting finding from the research that i've done as you both spoken about the climate club it may succeed if without relying solely on penalties for non compliance but also provide incentive for compliances maybe the trade intensive nations implement a harmonized border carbon adjustments for the example trade flow competitiveness issues would be elevated and uh, incentive to take climate policies would be adequate to provide them access to vital market without being subjected to border carbon adjustments and robert it's amazing that you mentioned the paris agreements and ndcs as uh, on the path to net zero both familiar and an unique obstacles will be encountered with carbon leakage reductions international competitiveness decarbonization capacity and yes its implementation among the leading influences so i think ets as cap falling to near zero a re-evolution of degree of or the free allocation granted to specific economic sector is necessary as well as to control the threat to carbon leakage with uh, allocations and other methods like cbam so as we now came to the end of this podcast where we started with a question that is achieving net zero and having the problem of carbon leakage is a paradox so from the all the discussions and my findings world's major countries targeted the road to net zero may not neglect carbon leakage during the policy making and implementations otherwise could lead to the phenomena of paradoxical scenario as climate tensions become more aggressive most of the model that has been discussed in my dissertation and reports are indicating that leakage rates between 5 and 
Hence, carbon leakages therefore can be mitigated if carbon-intensive business of trading partners are likewise subjected to climate policies. That includes sectoral climate agreements, focused technology transfer, and multilateral and bilateral fundings. And I like that you also comment on targets because it's re- important that we have this learning curve. We continue traveling on that. I think what targets give us is a direction for how we apply our efforts. So if we have a two degrees target and towards 1.5 degrees, we know that our learning is towards how do we achieve that. And we can focus our energy more effectively than if we didn't have a global target. Yes, of course. And adding to your comment, in the course of prioritizing our goals, we also need to streamline the factors which are concerning the road to net zero and reaching towards the destination if the exact amount of emissions are not being calculated and which also includes the risk of carbon leakage, then it won't be actual zero, what we are calling it as a paradox, right? <laughs> so i really like to thank you, Robert, and thank you, Ronit, for your presence and the valuable insight and the amazing discussion that we had. I really appreciate your acceptance on the invite. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks thanks for the invitation and I look forward to uh, seeing what you find out from the project as well. I think it's excellent research and exactly what we need right now. So well done. Thank you. Thank you, Saikat. And all the best for your research as well. I'm sure uh, you will be doing a great work. <laughs> so all the best. And at last but not the least, I really want to thank my supervisor, Dr. David Kamafort and University of Strathlight for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be a part of this and producing this podcast in line with my dissertation. Thank you so much to the listeners for staying with us till the end. Until then, bye-bye.